Great. So, hello, everybody. Welcome to PH870, quantum computation. Um, and uh, so, I had asked you to do this quantum error correction lab from the QIS kit book. Uh, now, uh, I will try to share it on the a projector, but for some reason, uh, again, Zoom has all these issues. It's not, it's not quite working properly for some reason, uh, right? So you can't, you can't see it on the on the projector. So you can please tell me or look in your laptops and tell me whatever your questions are. Zoom people, you can see my screen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, one question that. Uh, I've been asked about this. So steps A to E are fine. Okay. Uh, step F, identify. Okay. D also. Okay. Any others? Okay. So let me let me go with step F first. So step F says identify the logical X, L, and logical. ZL operators uh, for the three qubit uh, bit flip code, right? So logical means that obviously it acts on the whole set of three qubits, right? And as you can see in the workbook from what it says, Excel acts on zero, zero, zero. What does Excel do on a single qubit? It's the bit flip. So on the three qubits, it should flip all three qubits. Construct a circuit to perform uh, this bit flip, okay? And then uh, the logical Z operator for the three qubit flip code will be what? It will be the same thing, right? Now, how would you construct this uh, Excel operator out of uh, individual single qubit operators? That's it. So what? So that would be it, right? So, I mean, what was the confusion? Hmm? One? One line of code where? Right. Is that what you're saying? Well, no, I mean, it doesn't say anything about how many lines of code you have to write. It doesn't say anything like that, no? I mean, even if it does say that you only have to write one line of code, that doesn't mean that, I mean, the point is to get to, to achieve a certain objective, right? It doesn't matter how many lines of code you need to do for that. Is that fine? Okay, so I, that clarifies the part F, I think, unless there is any other doubt about that. Okay, now shall I go to step D then? Or Shantanu, have you cleared up step D? So step D is says complete the dictionary in the following cell to make the syndrome lookup table for all the single blip flip errors on the three qubit code. So first of all, uh, just a very quick reminder for those who might still be learning Python. A dictionary is a set of uh, tuples, set of pairs. So for instance, this is one pair. Right, and these pairs are separated by commas. The first element of a pair is called the key and the second element is called a value. Uh, Prasad is asking me to repeat the answer for part F. So the answer for part F is that Prasad, this is simply going to be X, 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 that's it. Where, where, or X1, X2, X3, is that, Clear, Prasad? Uh, yes, sir. So it's just tensor product of X gate. Uh, I can't hear you. I have to speak loudly, man. It will be like tensor product of three X gates, sir. Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. 
All right. So let me go to step D. Complete the dictionary in the following cell to make the syndrome lookup table for all single bit flip errors on two qubit code. Uh, people who are here, you can hear me now. So can you turn your audio off so that there is no echo? Um, okay, so the, the key, and you don't have uh, your laptop or anything, maybe you can sit, I don't know, next to one of the people and see what I'm talking about. Um, I mean, I, it's up to you. Uh, then then uh, whatever, whatever you feel comfortable, right? So <clears throat> the first two key, the first two key value pairs are given, right? Um, uh, so we want the syndrome lookup table, right? For the single bit flip errors. Um, now, so, so what is the meaning of, of, of uh, syndrome lookup table? Can somebody tell me? Mm -hmm. Right, so depending on the syndrome measurement, you have to apply the appropriate gain, right? So if your syndrome is zero, zero, then the gate you apply is identity, right? I zero, I one, I two. It's asking you to fill in the value, uh, values for zero, one and one zero. I think it's easy enough to fill that in. For one, one, for instance, it's I zero, I, I one, X two, I two. For zero, one and one zero, I'm sure you can fill in. We've talked about this in the, in the class last time, right? It's Shantanu? Well, like, we see that in case of that second bit, we see that to x and 6, right? Uh -huh. So that will be like. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so please, please. One, one case, that, one case. that one case, yeah. I, I, it should be, I don't know, maybe, maybe there's something wrong in the, in, in the logic that we have worked out. So you're saying the one, one case should be X, X zero, X one, X two. Is that, is that, is that your doubt? Uh, hmm? Yeah, no, we have a single bit flip, but remember what happens is that uh, we put the, this thing, uh, the recovery circuits one after the other, right? So if it is zero one, please turn off that audio, whoever is listening. Uh, if it is uh, zero one, for instance, it flips only A. If it's one zero, it flips only C. If it's one one, it flips B. But if it's one one, then what will happen is it will flip B, but it will also flip A and C. You understand? Because those, those circuits are in, in, in series, right? So the alternative, the, the solution to that is that when it is one, one, you flip B, but you also flip A and C to compensate for that extra flip, which is coming from the other, other two recoveries, right? And as we worked out in, on, on, on Quark last time, that is the code that was working, right? I don't, I don't know if you, if you are following or not. If you're not following, let me, let me uh, show it here, okay? One second, I'll, again, I have to share screen and all that. So just give me a second. Not this. Right, so this is the one, right? 
We're, so what we are doing is we are performing the parity check, right? So we have our, our code qubits, right? And our parity qubits. We perform the parity check, store it in A, perform the parity check uh, and store it in A. That is the parity check for A and B, right? Then we perform the parity check on B and C and store it in the second qubit, the second ancilla. And then we, we have this lookup table, right? This is our lookup table. So if it is zero, zero, we don't do anything. If A and if these, these two parity bits, uh, let me call this P1 and P2, these parity qubits, if they are both zero, zero, we don't do anything. And the, all of the, all of the, these, so this is the recovery part, right? And the recovery is a, some control followed by X and the control is based on the parity value of the parity qubit. So if the parity qubits are zero, zero, then this recovery doesn't do anything and that's fine. Okay. Because again, under our assumptions, that means there is no error. Now, so if B and C is one, right? And A and B is zero, then the C qubit has flipped. So we perform a flip on the C qubit, right? If A and B is one and B and C is zero, then A has flipped, we perform a flip on A. Right? But if both are flipped, right? So we put a control control. If both are flipped, B has flipped. So we put a flip on X. But the point is that if this condition is true, then it will also trigger this action first. It will trigger this action and it will trigger this action. Right? An alternative would be to construct a gate which, which takes a form like this, rather than just being a controlled, not controlled on the basis of one bit, something like this, which said that uh, this is your control, that means this has to be one, and this is your anti-control, that means this has to be zero. And then this acts on your, on your C, like this. You understand? So this would only act if the control was one and the anti-control was zero, right? But since we are not, we haven't done that here, we put in this extra X and this extra X to compensate for these. Things. The amount of complexity is the same, whether we do it this way or whether we do it that way. I would argue that this, this, this method is probably simpler. Because here, uh, well, I, I, mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe it is, maybe it's not. Anyway, so this is, the, uh, this is the answer, I think, to the question about the lookup table. Right, Shantanu? Yes. Okay. One one should probably be uh, x zero x. I mean, look, I haven't worked out the lab. You guys have, so so you guys should, uh, you know, base your judgments on 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 what is in front of you. Right? Are there any any questions, Zoomies? I think what they've, they've done is instead of you know like they've actually measured the two uh, auxiliary bits and then based on the measurement they've just used if else condition. Like uh, yeah, just that zero one. So when there is a one one condition, we only know that B is flipped, right? So they've directly done that. What we have done is that we have not done the measurement. We have just uh, used the. No, 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 no. But I explained this to you last time, right? That. Yeah. That there, there is a principle of deferred measurement. Do you remember that? Do you remember that uh, principle I talked about? Yes. Did you come to the last class? Yes, I was there. 
So the principle of deferred measurement, do you remember what it is? Yeah, I can I can move the measurement and yet it should not change the so, as so long as as long as it's not converted into classical. Yeah, so I so I mean what you're saying it wouldn't make any difference whether I measure before or after the recovery. Yeah, what I'm saying is like they're not making a continuous uh, circuit. They're like finding out whether it is zero one. If it is zero one, they're directly applying the gate. What we are doing here is uh, we are we are making a you know general generalized case where uh, based on zero one, it will always work. Like oh, not based on the lab. Yeah, I'm I'm saying what they've done in the expected in the lab and what we have done in the class. Are you talking about the lab? Is that what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, yeah. So so in in real life, we don't have that option. Okay, so in the lab, I want you to build it the way I've done it in class. Okay, because in real life, see, it doesn't make sense. It, it is very, very inefficient. It doesn't make any sense. You don't want to have a recovery like which has, there's some if and then and else, right? It should be like, bam, that's it. You don't have, need any external interference. You don't need any external logic. Right? And this circuit does all of that. Okay? Yeah, okay, sir. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Sana uh, and Shankrava and Prasad, etc. Please ask, okay? Um, sir, in part F, there is another question. Yeah? No, I'm unable to do that. In part F, uh, this thing, the minimal weight that. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, did you guys see that? Ujwal, Ujwal, right? No, no. Yeah, Rohan, Rohan. Did you did you do that second part in part F? Find the minimal weight encoded logical Z. Ah, uh, see, that's that's. Mm -hmm. Did anybody here do that second that second part of part F? No. Okay. All right. So let me again. Uh, hmm? Let me again share the screen and so that people can know what you're talking about. Okay. So this is the part F. Let me read it, read it, uh, <coughs> read it out. And uh, I think I didn't start the recording. Did I start the recording? Okay, good. Find the minimal weight encoded logical Z. There are four equivalent logicals where uh, Z logical acting on plus is minus. Uh, right? Okay, so first of all, uh, the notation, right? So we have the 0, 0, 0 and the 1, 1, 1. That is a logical zero and the logical one. Then similarly, we'll have the logical plus and the logical minus. Logical plus will be plus, plus, plus. Logical minus will be minus, minus. What is the action of Z on the plus state? Z acts like a, a bit flip, right? On the, so the Hadamard basis. So ZL acting on the plus, Logical should give you the minus logical. Okay. So it asks uh, what is the minimal weight encoded logical Z? And the second thing is what is the distance of the three qubit flip code? Can it detect and or correct a single face flip Z error? Okay, so these two terminologies are described here. What is the weight of an operator? So the weight of an operator is the number of qubits it acts non-trivially on. Prasad, are you are you following? Uh, yes, sir. So, so this Z1, Z2 has weight 2, right? So the minimal weight encoded logical Z, okay? And now it says there are four equivalent logical Zs where ZL is, uh, so now 
This is a question for you to solve. It's a, it's a problem for you to work out, right? The obvious answer is, obvious answer is what? Z, Z, Z. That is, but that is weight three. The fact that it's saying find the minimal weight means that there might be another operator which does the same thing, right? So this I will leave, leave to you to work out, okay? And if you cannot do that, then we'll talk about it in the next class. Okay, Prasad? Okay, sir. Right, I mean, it's a problem. If I answer it, then, uh, well, that's no, no fun for you. Then can it detect or correct a single phase? What is the distance of the three qubit flip, bit flip code? Now the distance is, the definition of distance is given here, right? The minimal number of errors that will change one logical code word basis state to another or the maximum number of errors that can be detected. So what is the maximum number of errors that can be detected by the bit flip? One. Uh, what is the minimum number of errors uh, that will change one logical code word basis state to another? Two. Two. Which, which ones? The third one will be determined by the right. So if you if you if you start with um, zero zero zero, let's say, right? If you have a bit flip error on any two qubits, then that will change the state it will be corrected to to one one one. Understand, Prasad? Somewhat. Somewhat. Okay, so let me uh, go back to my notes and I have to write this. Okay, so today's date is lecture 23. Okay, so these are the two questions right now. One is what is the weight of an operator? So if you have n qubits, then a weight k operator has the form um, Right, so th this this is an this is an operator acting on n qubits. So if only k of these are not are non-trivial, that means only k of these are non non not equal to the identity. Right, then it's a weight k of it. So example z one, z two, z three. This has weight three. Z1, identity two, identity three. This has weight one, etc. Okay. Then the second thing is the code distance. Okay. So now the code distance is defined as the either so. It is the minimum number of errors which will change uh, one logical state into another. Okay, so okay, so this is one condition. So in our in our case, let's say our original state is zero zero zero. If I have one error on this, does this change to the second logical state? 
No, because the error correction, the recovery oper operation will bring me back to zero, zero, zero. Right? If I have a single qubit error, but if I have two qubit errors, then the recovery operation will bring me back to what? One, one, one. Right, Prasad? Yes, sir. So, so here, the minimum number of errors that will change us from one logical state to another is two, right? Okay, the second uh, criterion is the maximum number of errors which can be detected. Now, what is the maximum number of errors which can be detected in this case? One. Here the maximum number is just one, right? Because that's by, by design. If you have more than one error, it automatically changes the, it goes to the different basis, right? So the distance is, um, which one is it? It's, it's one of these values, right? It's either this or this one. Is it the minimum or the maximum? Uh, let me think. I think it's the, uh, the distance is probably the maximum of whichever one of these values is higher. So in this case, the distance of the three qubit code is two, okay? All right, so I uh, will uh, is it is this are there any other questions? No, so we are we are talking about the bit flip error only. No? We are talking about the three qubit bit flip code, no? In step C, it says implement the parity check gates to detect and localize a single bit flip error. I'm looking at part one only. Uh, so where does it say anything about phase flips? Where is it? it? Is it saying anything about phase? It's not saying anything about phase. I don't know. Figure it out. Let us all know. Okay. I mean, how do you solve? I don't know. How does a black hole emit radiation? Figure it out. Let me know. I don't have the answer to all the questions, right? No, I mean, like, okay, that, that's a question that you have, fine, great. But for now, like, I want to talk about, honestly speaking, I don't have the answer to your question, okay? That's the simple and uh, straightforward answer. Okay, now any other questions about the workbook? If not, then I will uh, continue talking a little bit more about it. Yeah, we'll, 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 yeah, you will get an extension. Of course, you'll get an extension. Okay. Uh, this whole thing is correct only one bit of code. That's what we have done, right? Right? And the thing is that, look, if you have a circuit where you have, a three qubit code, let's say, a three qubit repetition code. And in that, two of your qubits are, are getting flipped. Then you have a problem. That's like, you can, you can probably design a circuit which corrects that also. But then that is such an error prone hardware that you should probably like, you know, Look at your single qubit, the quality of your single qubit before proceeding further. Okay. 
All right, any other questions from the Zoomies? No. No, sir. No, sir. Okay, great. All right. Sir, could you just send the previous two classes notes, the PDF? I'll think about it, Mega. Okay, sir. Why don't you come to class? No, I I come I'll come sir. But I've written everything, but I think my handwriting and I'm getting confused in my own notes. So if so, you want to do error correction, right? Yes. By comparing to my writing, I'll I'll send it. I'll send it. Okay. Okay. Everything I don't do as quickly as is ideal. Okay. I'll send it. All right. So now uh, there are a couple of other things. So first of all, uh, I'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, there's a general theory of error correction for error correction codes. I'll talk a little bit about that just now. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, stabilizers, stabilizer codes. And um, then the next topic uh, is I'm going to continue talking about quantum phase estimation. The Fourier transform I had covered in some detail. I think we've had some time to let that material settle into our brains. Uh, see, learning is a process in which, um, you know, your, your brain is a circuit, right? You put new knowledge to it. When you put new knowledge into it, it heats up. And then you have to let it cool down. In, in physics, that is known as annealing. Right? There are two different kinds of Processes. There is annealing, which is a gentle cool down, and there's a quench. A quench is when you suddenly change the temperature of the system. So if you let it anneal, right, then it settles down into a new state in which that knowledge is encoded in there. If you continue to heat it up without letting it anneal, things will jumble up. That has been my motivation for stopping after quantum Fourier transformation, doing something new, okay? Whether or not I'm successful in that, I don't know, time will take. Okay, so now I will uh, talk about uh, the general theory of quantum error correction, okay? And, uh, so let's do that. Okay. So this is the, the definition of a quantum error correcting code is as follows. A quantum error correcting code consists of um, a Hilbert space, which is your uh, your physical Hilbert space, uh, which we can write as H, a subspace of this physical Hilbert space, which is the code space, right? So for instance, for the three qubit code, your physical Hilbert space is the set of uh, the three qubit states, eight of them. The code space is the set of zero, 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 and one, one, one. And then there is a set of errors which are correctable, which this code can correct, okay? So another way to write that is as n k, and then you have some, so n is the dimension of your physical Hilbert space, k is the dimension of your code space, code subspace, and then the number of errors which you can correct is some, the third one, whatever it is, okay? Now, so in our case, so what, what, what do these E alpha mean? So this is some discrete set of uh, 
correctable errors. Okay, and the uh, the the theory is the following: that this code is error correcting, right? Or we say that what is the statement? One second. Um, Right. So we also denote this set by f by some e curly e, and we say the code is a this curly e correcting if the following is true. So for any any state psi which lives in the code subspace, acting on it with some element of e will give me a, an error. And acting on this with some element of the recovery of the set of recovery operators, right? This should give me the identity. So this should be equal to the state psi. Okay. Now this this is not something very sophisticated. I mean, this is very obvious, right? This is simply saying that you have some you have some Hilbert space. So, for example, here uh, for the three qubit uh, code, what is H? It's the set of states for right. It's the set of eight states. So the code subspace is the subspace of H, right? It's a subset, subspace of H. What are the set of errors? If you're talking about the bit flip, then the set of errors consists of what? X1, X2, X3, right? And then we have some set of recovery operations, okay? So the point is that uh, this is the, what an error correcting code does, right? Okay, so this, there's nothing really to understand at, at this stage. What happens is that there is a certain condition which must be satisfied for this uh, to work as an error correcting code. And the condition is the following. So let me write it down, then I will explain it, okay? So we have our code subspace, and let's say that it is spanned by uh, a set of elements, right? Some K elements, right? Because it's K dimensional. So this error correcting code, and we label it with C, which is the same letter as, as this for some reason. I mean, you can call it whatever you want. C is an curly E correcting code. And see, it's important to keep in mind that the code should also include the set of errors which it corrects. That's why we have this statement, curly E correcting code. Because the recovery operations depend on what the errors are, right? So this is a curly E correcting code, if and only if, for all states, for any pair of states in the code subspace, the following condition is true. Okay, so let me write it down first and then I will explain to you what this condition means. Uh, 
okay so the what is going on over here right you have e alpha acting on psi j right so psi j is some code word e alpha is some letter error so this is a code word with some error fine i'll call it psi j prime e beta acts on psi i okay this gives us the code word the ith code word with some error so i'll call it psi i prime now if you have two different incorrect code words this condition is saying the following this condition is saying that psi i prime psi j prime in a product right why because if you take the adjoint of this expression what will you get you will get adjoint catch psi i and then hermitian conjugate e beta right so that's what this expression is equivalent to it's the inner product of these two incorrect code words now any two incorrect code words should be orthogonal <coughs> why can you state that in a slightly better way so essentially what it says is that two errors should not overlap because if they overlap then there is no way to unambiguously correct the error right as an example let's say that i have i have the letter 1 and i have the letter let's say 2 okay which looks like this now i have some error which erases part of the letter 1 and leaves me with the middle part okay so i'll put that in a different color one second and then i have some error which acts on 2 and leaves me with the middle part so i'll just put some okay so this set of pixels is left now can i reverse this error to find out which one is the uh, you know on the corrected code word i can't do that right because either one of these could correspond to one or two right so another way to think of it is that let's say you have a picture you have you have a photograph of the mona lisa this this is this is exactly how da vinci started the sketch okay now you imagine that there is some error which corresponds to erasure of something of some portion right now if i erase the whole thing can i correct it no right but if i erase some portion then it can be corrected right and if i erase some other portion that can also be corrected you understand so the there is a certain set of errors right so in this instance for you could imagine dividing this up into a grid maybe something like this and you could say that okay if i erase any one of these grid squares i can correct that right or depending on the type of drawing it is you know depending on the how the different pieces look like 
you might be able to erase more than one piece. The maximum such set, right? That will be your maximum possible error. But if you go beyond that, you won't be able to recover it. Now, in this case, so if I have these, these boxes, if I erase this box, right? And I erase this box, right? And there is some overlap between these two, right? So let's say my boxes have some overlap. And I erase both the boxes. Can I uniquely recover my picture? No, because there is an overlap, right? That overlap region is not, it's not clear which box did, does it belong to. So this has to be equal to zero if I and J are not equal, right? So that's why you get the Delta IJ factor here. Right? So if delta ij, so this has to be proportional to delta ij. Okay. So this means um, that our, our code words should be distinguishable. Well, our code words with error should be distinguished. After Okay, the second thing is, um, what about uh, this C alpha beta over here, right? This, this coefficient here. Okay, so for instance, you could have different errors. You could have a, you could have I and J to be the same, right? So you have different errors acting on the same code word, right? So you would have psi i, epsilon beta, epsilon e alpha, psi i. Now we've already said that this should be the proportional to delta ij, right? But since i is i is and j are the same, well, okay, but then the question is that should this depend on I? Like for instance, instead of delta ij over here, I could have a factor here of lambda i delta ij. Right? In which case, this result would be equal to C alpha beta lambda i. Right? But if this is the case, one second, one second. If this is the case that different errors acting on the same code word is depends on the code word itself. That is what this factor of lambda i does. Then what that tells me is that when I perform the syndrome measurements, right? I will gain some information about which code word I'm, I am on which code word there is an error. You understand? Because what does the syndrome tell me? Syndrome tell me, tells me, so in identifying the error, we would acquire some information about the state itself. But if you acquire some information about the state itself, then you are performing a measurement on the state, which would disturb the state. So this cannot depend on lambda i. So at most it can be, so it is a number first of all, because it's an expectation value. And so at most it can be some function of the indices alpha beta. Now you have a question. The, the, the second part, this one. So each E alpha is a different error, right? So for instance, in my, in my three qubit code word, in my three qubit case, right? This is my, let's say, 
as an example, my side I, I have different errors, right? What are my possible errors? Let's say I have E1 is equal to X1 and E2 is equal to X2. These are different errors, right? Now, if I act with X, X1 and X2, okay? So now, and these are Hermitian, so I can just write this. Right? This is the statement here. This is an example of this expression, right? This should not depend on my choice of the code word. Because if it depends on my choice of the code word, that means that the in the process of uh, determining the form of the error, I will gain information about the precise state also. Because remember that the code word, these are the basis states. A general state in your code subspace, right? That is your message, let's say, is what? It's some superposition of your code word basis, right? I is equal to one to K. Your, you have some logical qubits, which, are, which is this set of k logical qubits. Your message which you want to protect is in general, it's some superposition of these logical qubits, right? It's not, I mean, we, we perform all our error correcting operations on the 0, 0, 0s and the 1, 1, 1s. But the linearity of quantum mechanics assures us that once we have done that, I can put into the circuit any linear superposition of 0, 0, 0, and 1, 1, 1. And my circuit will correct that and give me back the same, same state at the end. Right? It will correct the 0, 0, 0, any errors on the 0, 0, 0 individually and on the 1, 1, 1s individually. Right? As long as I'm talking about whatever my restricted class of errors, for instance, a single qubit error, right? I don't have to bring, make, make two different circuits for that. Why? Because it's a, it's a quantum mechanical system, right? So see, so this, this, is, this is very important to understand, right? When I perform this kind of an error correction or recovery operation, this I write this ABC as if they are different qubits. But this state can be any state which lives in my code subspace. Right? So if my code subspace is a three qubit subspace, my state can be any linear combination of the of the logical qubits, right? And if, if my logical qubits, if I have more than one logical qubit, right? Let's say that I have a circuit which, in which I have more than one logical qubit. So, so for instance, the nine qubit code, okay? So let's say I have, these are my two sets of logical qubits, right? This is the logical qubit, first one, this is the second one. Then the state that I input into this can be any state which lives in the logical Hilbert space, right? So it can be any combination of these basis states which span the, in this case, two-dimensional logical Hilbert space, right? And many of those states will be entangled with each other. In many of those states, there will be entanglement. But the circuit will, the circuit doesn't care because it acts linearly. It doesn't care whether I, I sent in 0, 0 plus 1, 1 or whether I sent in just 0 to the first set and just 1 to the second set with some error, let's say.
So that's why in this in this statement. This statement says that different errors acting on the same code word should not have any dependence on that code word itself. And if you have this requirement, then you can take any state, any, any code state, which is made of some linear superposition of these code states, right? And now let me let me ask what happens if I take the same error, okay? And I act on, or different error, sorry. And I act on some arbitrary element of the code subspace, okay? Not just on a basis state of the code subspace, but on an arbitrary element. What will I get? So I'll get summation of i and j. I'll get alpha i star psi i. This is a C, by the way. This is a C. C for code. And E beta. This is alpha, sorry. E alpha. And then psi j. And then alpha j. Okay. Now, if you say that this expression here, right, if it depends on, well, the first thing is that if i is not equal to j, this expression will be zero, right? That part we understand. So putting that restriction in will reduce this expression to a single sum over i, right? We'll get sum over i, we'll get alpha i square, beta, alpha, psi i, right? And now the thing is, that each one of these terms, if these terms depended on i, right, then I would get some knowledge in the process of detecting the error. And this is the part, I guess, which I haven't explained to you why that would be the case. So you can just take it as a given for now. Okay, in the process of doing this, you would gain some knowledge about the state itself. And that would, uh, that is not something we want, right? So that's how we get this condition. And this is the quantum error correcting code condition. So these conditions must be satisfied in order for this to be a code space and for this, these to be a set of errors which can be corrected. Okay, now there are um, there are a lot of other concepts uh, in error correction uh, which I haven't talked about. For instance, there are classical codes. Um, for example, the, the Shor's three qubit code comes from the classical repetition code. Right in the classical repetition code. So you have quantum codes, right? Well, it turns out that you have classical codes also, right? So in the classical code, your logical bit is zero, 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 and your logic, right? One, one, one. This is your logical bit. In your quantum code, what happens? You convert these two states. Okay. So your classical codes work the same way. The only difference is that in the classical case, you don't have a superposition of different bits of the state of different bits, right? Here, you don't have something like alpha zero L plus beta one L, right? You don't have that. It's either zero or one, right? But the overall structure is 
not very different okay now uh, so let me actually uh, talk a little bit about uh, what a classical code is okay so a classical code is so we say and these are linear code by the way <coughs> why linear well because if you want um, to take something and transfer it to quantum mechanics it helps to have a linear structure okay so a linear code c okay encodes k bits of information into n bit code space all right and uh, such a code is specified by a matrix which is called a generator matrix and this matrix is a n by k dimensional matrix okay so where so n is your number of um uh physical bits and k is your number of logical bits for example for the repetition code the matrix is 1 1 right what is the number of physical bits 3 the number of logical bits is 1 right the entries the elements of gij are all either zeros or one more in a more slightly more technical manner statement this is an element of z2 z2 is just the group with two elements or it is 0 1 modulo addition modulo 2 basically so we are doing binary arithmetic what this matrix does is you give it a message you act on it on that message with this matrix and it gives you the coded version of that message okay so if you have a message x then we express that message as a vector okay and we take our matrix g and act on x and this is our encoded message okay uh so sorry one second uh the message is yeah so the message is actually uh the message is a how many elements will there be in the message how many bits are we encoding we are encoding k so the x will also be k elements and when we multiplied by g of x we get something which has n elements right so to be more precise uh if i take an n by k matrix right and so there are k columns and then i multiply it by something which has k rows what will i get i'll get something which has n rows right so this is my message uh uncoded message this is my encoded message 
right? And this is my generator. Okay. So for example, in this, um, for the one qubit code, my generator matrix is G. Uh, my message only has one component. It can be either zero or one, right? And uh, the result of encoding zero or one will just be zero, 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 or one, 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 okay? So, um, so this is called a NK code. So this repetition code is a three comma one code, okay? Now let's look at another kind of repetition code. Let's, which encodes two bits, okay? In three logical, in three physical bits. So let's look at another example. This is called a six two code. So your generator matrix will be uh, six rows and two columns, okay? Now, if I, I'll write down the elements and once you look at the elements, it will become clear to you what's going on. Is it clear what's going on? If you look at the elements of this matrix, the first bit is being encoded here. The second bit is being encoded here, right? What were you saying, Sumo? I'm not sure if that is the way I would describe it, right? And what are the possible messages? Right, K is equal to two. So the possible messages are zero, zero, one zero and one one, right? What is G zero zero, right? It will be, I won't put any commas because it will become very tiring. Zero one one will be zero 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 one one one. G one zero will be one 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 zero zero zero. G11 will be right now. So the set of code words, right? The set of possible code words um, what is the possible set of code words? This is the these are the code words. Right? In the three qubit case, the code words were 0, 0, 0, and 1, 1, 1. Here, you have four code words. <clears throat> and if you look at the individual columns of this matrix, so let me call this column V1, let me call this column V2. Okay? So the possible code words of this code corresponds to the vector space. So there, these two, these are two vectors, in this case, six dimensional vectors. So V1 and V2 span a vector space, right? Because any two vectors, you can take a linear combination that gives you a vector space. Right? So the set of possible code words corresponds to this vector space. Okay? And when I say vector space, when I'm say writing alpha, beta and all. Alpha, beta or what? What kind of quantities are alpha and beta? 
no no they are not complex numbers what else can they be no well specifically which integers 0 and 1 because everything we are doing okay is is in this z2 which we can also write as uh, gf2 so this is this is a field this is called a field okay real numbers are a field complex numbers are a field but there are an infinite number of other fields this is this is one field a field is any set of elements in which on which you can define multiplication and addition so if you have let's say 0 and 1 okay with addition mod 2 you can perform all the elements of arithmetic on this field on this on this set so it forms a field similarly if you have 0 1 till n mod what mod what does mod mean modulus modulus n plus 1 so actually i should say n minus 1 modulo n this is the field zn right so that means i can take the sum of any two numbers but it can never be larger than n right i take the modulus so i if i take 3 plus 4 mod 5 what is the answer 2 then okay? so i can perform subtraction i can perform addition right i can do all of that it's a field with respect to it forms a right allows me to do arithmetic so now if you look at the possible values of alpha and beta and the possible values of v1 and v2 what are the possible values of alpha and beta 0 and 1 right so if alpha is 0 and beta is 0 you get this code word right if alpha is 0 beta is 1 you get this guy this guy and this guy right so you get precisely the vector space right which is generated by by the by these two vectors but which but which vector space the vector space living on the field on the z2 field not not the set of real vectors okay anyways i think i'll i'll, I'll stop here for now because uh, Uh, or maybe let me see uh, this is doesn't seem like a very good stopping point um okay i'll stop here we'll continue tomorrow with this and so i'll talk about uh, some more essential aspects of uh, these linear codes but the point is that once you understand uh, this theory of classical linear codes, and you can see why it is linear because everything is matrix multiplication, right? Then we will see that given any linear code, you can construct a quantum. Okay. Uh, all right. Any questions from the Zoom people? No, okay, all right, then I'll stop the recording.